One of the most impressive ground-based telescopes is ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's in chilly, really high altitude in the desert. Because of the wavelength that ALMA looks at, you don't want water interfering with the photons that you're collecting from an object. So you go really high up, so the atmosphere is shorter, you go to a desert where there's not a lot of water in the air, and you get really high resolution images. But ALMA is also an array of telescopes. It's comprised of 66 dishes, radio dishes, that can move around. Because when you have a single telescope, your resolution is limited by the radius of that disk. But if you have an array, it can act as an interferometer. And the further you move those guys apart, the higher resolution your image can be. The ALMA dishes can be as close as 150 meters to each other, or they can be as far away as 16 kilometers. Kilometer with a K. That's huge, right? And you might ask if, if you pull the dishes apart more, you get a better image. Why not build a telescope all over the world? And, and they've done that. ALMA is a part of that collaboration. It's called the Event Horizon Telescope. They took a picture of a black hole. ALMA can look at really interesting stuff like dust. Uh, so it's taken a lot of pictures of like baby solar systems and you can start seeing even things like exoplanets getting born, which is really neat. It participated in the EHT collaboration. Like this is a really valuable resource doing really cool science. In fact, between First Light in 2013 and 2018, ALMA celebrated the publication of the 1000th ALMA paper, which this is a different video, but a thousand papers. Do we, do we really need a thousand papers in five years? That's 17 papers a month. It's almost like academia has a problem where they require you to write a paper to get a job or a grant. And it doesn't really matter if you have something interesting to say. It's like, oh, you could write one paper on your data set or you could split it into a series of seven. And then you have seven papers on your little list of your gold stars. It's fine. It's not like one person at Alma wrote a thousand papers, right? It's a bunch of different groups who apply for observing time. They get the data and they do all kinds of different stuff on it. This video is about how in October of 2022, Alma got hacked. Alma went down. Alma went dark. And nobody talked about it? Genius. Hacker. MIT. I heard about Alma getting hacked in December, like late December, like December 29th on Twitter. And the tweet was like, isn't it weird that Alma got hacked and nobody's talking about it? And yes, I do think that's weird. M me learning that on Twitter months after it happened is insane to me. Like imagine if right now you're just in the bathroom and you're like, haven't seen any pictures from JWST in a while. And so you're scrolling down Google and like the 19th result is a blog post from NASA, like a paragraph that's just like, oh, by the way, hackers broke into JWST and drove it into the sun. So no more JWST. Surely we would have heard about it. Surely, why wasn't it on the news? Alma got hacked? What do we know about this guy? He's a convicted hacker serving 15 years at MIT. Genius coder. On October 29th, 2022, someone, we could call him Jerry, got a phishing email, clicked on the link, downloaded a file he wasn't supposed to download, and ran an executable he wasn't supposed to run. And as a result, Omla's network, their emails, their files were all infiltrated by malware. And very quickly, the IT team was like, something is happening, and they just hit the stop button and shut it down. So like the website went down, the email servers went down, the telescope went dark. And for 48 days, no observations happened at Alma. I saw a blog post that's since been deleted from no mid-November where they're like, hey, we're still working on things. We hope to have the website back up by late December. No data was lost. Like we're not paying a ransom, everything's fine. And I saw a tweet, of course, in December, like late December, like December 29th, that said, how has this telescope been hacked for two months and no one's saying anything, no one's talking about it. And when I opened that tweet, the first response was from all on the Twitter and they were like, hey, we went back up December 19th. Everything's back to normal. We're back in business, babe. And I just can't believe it. <laughs> they were down for 48 days and no one talked about it. It's barely a blip on their Wikipedia page now. They were hacked and now it's fine. Anyway, that, that's that's how to hack a telescope. If all you came for was all my getting hacked, that, that was it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Um, genius. Hacker. MIT. 
So for the rest of the video, I just want to talk about ransomware because I don't understand how it works. Like, what was the point of all that? They hacked a telescope. They didn't make the news. No one bragged about it. And the telescope only lost 48 days and nothing else. All the data was fine. Everything was fine. What was the point? You didn't get any money. How does ransomware actually work? Is this an actual scam? Like, what is it? I just, I, I love learning about scams because I don't understand how they work most of the time. Like obviously on a purpose, scams are like opaque to the person that's not scamming. They're hard to understand. So you fall for the scam. Genius, hacker, MIT. So here's how ransomware works. They send you an email with the malware and they try to get you to click on it. And if you click on it, oh no, your computer has been hacked, hacked. By the way, I think it's really funny that the Alma IT team like 100% knows who clicked the file. And I bet in January of this year, they had like mandatory security training, but like really it was just mandatory for Jerry. <laughs> so the, the file tells you to run an executable, you run it, and now it's just infected your computer and it starts going through your files and locking them up. And you might not even notice this is happening. For like an hour and a half while you watch Netflix and then you go to your desktop and everything is gone and you're like, uh-oh. They might take the data, but they might not. They might just lock it. So like you don't have access to it. And if you try to open it in any way, you're gonna corrupt the file and that's gonna be gone. And that's, 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 the, that's the hack. They've done it again. But here's my issue. When you do a scam, like you do it to make money, you, you hacked Alma and now you have Alma data, like the FITS files from the observations or whatever. Like who are you gonna sell that data to? Only like astronomers even know what to do with the data and you can't actually buy astronomy data on the dark web and then publish it and be like, oh, it's a different telescope. It's not Alma, it's a, it's a different telescope of 36 dishes in the Atacama Desert. Like no one's gonna buy that. Except while I was thinking about this topic, I saw a group of physicists who did actually steal someone's Alma data. <laughs> they actually stole the Alma data. Like, they took the plots from the papers and they cited the original author, but they were like, but this is our paper now. We're doing this now. They even stole the title, except they made it worse. They stole it and it was published. The journal published it. They just stole it. I don't understand the point of a scam where there's only one customer for the thing you've stolen. Right, the only people they can sell the Alma data back to, the only person that wants the unlock key is Alma. You know, if you hacked a single person, like you go, you go fishing, <laughs> all the words are so stupid. You hacked and you fished. You successfully hack some grandma in Idaho and she's just playing the gem game, Bejeweled, on her computer when she goes to her desktop and she sees that all the screenshots of Facebook posts about her granddaughter, Tiller Hayes, are now gone. Like you've successfully scammed Mima. She can't see her grandchild anymore. And you you pop up your little, this is a ransom, give me bitcoins. Like you've successfully scammed Mima, and you have the data. The only one who wants those pictures is Mima, right? And they're just pictures. She She could get better quality pictures from her daughter. She could just text and be like, oh no, they've, they've bitcoined me again. And can you send me the pictures? And like the granddaughter would be like, oh, of course we have multiple backups of our data. By the way, if you've made it this far in the video, you should back up your data. You know, flash drives are like $10 at Target. Just, just save all your photos. The thing about only having one customer is like, fine, that scam could work, except Mima now hates you. She hates you more than she's hated anyone in her entire life, right? You came into her home while she's just playing Bejeweled and having her morning coffee and you took her pictures of the most important thing in her life and now you're asking her for money is she gonna give you that money how often do ransomware scams work a traditional ransom i have stolen your child give me a million dollars in unmarked non-sequential bills and put them under a park bench and i will drop your son at this drop point right if someone steals your child you're very motivated to pay a ransom but data is not a real thing like Data's just bits and bytes and, and numbers, right? It's not, it's not a material thing that you can't reproduce. I mean, in the most drastic case, 
all my data. If you took a picture of a galaxy seven years ago with Alma, you can't replace that, right? Because seven years ago is in the past and we're in the future and time changes things. It's not like they stole the actual telescope, it's just data. Like someone steals pictures of your granddaughter, they're just pictures, they're not your granddaughter. It's, it's not a real thing. Data's not real? Is this a controversial opinion that data's not a real thing? Chapters of the bookstore got hacked and they were down for months as well and no one was talking about it. Uh, this was recently, like early 2023, and their website went down and then it came back up and they, you just couldn't make orders. You had to go in store and they were cash only for a while. And a bunch of people who made pre-orders in like November for books that came out in February, they lost the pre-order list and they took a while to get it back. But again, Chapters didn't pay the ransom. They just shut down and came back up with better and bigger and brighter software. The, the data that the hackers in that case were gonna sell was employee data. And honestly, in Alma's case, that's probably what they were after too. Like nobody cares about the FITS files. They were probably like, we have the social security numbers or whatever the Chilean version of social security number is for all your workers. We're gonna put them in the deep dark, the deep dark deep web. Chapters was like, well, it doesn't make sense to pay a ransom for this because it doesn't make sense, right? Because data is not a thing. <laughs> if Chapters was to purchase the data back, it's not like they get the only copy of the data. And if the scammers wanted, they could just also sell the data to someone else. It doesn't make sense to buy something you don't actually get. It doesn't make sense to pay the ransom in a ransomware attack. So how does the scam work? Chapters Alma, they both realized immediately, like, well, we're not paying the scammers. We'll just fix how they got in. We'll just train our people not to click links and emails, Jerry. So as I understand it, no one pays the ransoms. And the FBI says this as well. The majority of the time, nobody pays these ransoms. Nobody really steals the data. Like chapters, Alma, they come back online. Genius, hacker, MIT. So what's the purpose of this scam? Like, what does this person get out of it? You, you don't even make the news. I, I think the most disgusting part about this ransomware as a scam is that often when they get into your computer, something pops up that looks like this or like this or like this. And it's just so lame. It's so lame, I wanna cry. <laughs> like, I know you're not supposed to call things cringe cause it's cringe to cringe, but it's cringy, right? Like you're not the joker. You're just a loser who scams meme off for a living. Most of these people don't even write their own malware. You can just purchase that from a third party company. Like you're not, I've never seen this movie, the Saw guy, you're just, you're just a sad scammer. Like I get that some people make a living scamming people like MLM boss babes or like the guys who sell cartoon monkeys to their friends or like landlords, but at least they're not pretending that they're the joker. <laughs> Can you imagine the person? Like they, they emailed <laughs> some New Zealand guy and paid $7,000 for their little malware application. And it had like a submit your own end screen. And they're like typing it up like, ha ha ha, are you laughing yet? And they're like endlessly scrolling from Google image search to see the best Joker picture. They is cringe, genius, hacker, MIT. The thing about ransomware is that they ask for a ransom. And that's illegal. You can't just put your Venmo ID up. If you want to unlock your granddaughter's baby pictures, send this Venmo some cash because your Venmo is linked to who you are as a person, to your bank account and everything. So the FBI would figure out who you are, right? You can't ask for a wire transfer of money so that you can unlock the files. You have to ask for something untraceable, something super cool and hackery. You have to ask for Bitcoin. And I learned this from John Oliver's episode on ransomware. So if you would rather hear it from him, I'll link it below. Um, but you could come back after, I think it's fine. Like I know you would rather listen to John Oliver, me too, me too, but you could come back after. Imagine we have a normal distribution of all people. And on the X-axis, we have increasing technical skill. 
I didn't say intelligence, I said increasing technical skill. So like this first chunk here is just everyone who's ever opened a terminal. And then your next big chunk is all the people that can use email and Microsoft Word and they can open a PDF. And like if you're in a meeting and you have a presentation on your phone, this person knows more than two ways how to get this from your phone to the projector without making it a whole situation where you have to call IT. Okay, that's that's a lot of people. And then here you have people with less technical skill, people who maybe they don't use computers all day every day. Maybe they just check their email, they check Twitter. They use the internet mostly through apps and GUI. And then this last group, your 90 year old father calling you because Fox News is in Spanish and he's afraid and has no idea what to do. Okay, so this is a normal distribution of all the people with technical skill. It's qualitative, it's not quantitative. I haven't done a survey. It's a very scientific plot, asterisk. If I mapped onto this, the people who would fall for a scam I don't think it's controversial to say that in general, you're more likely to fall victim to a computer scam if you have less technical skill. However, the Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoins are required. So if we look at this plot again, and in green, I map onto this plot, the people who could easily buy a Bitcoin and take it from one wallet and put it into a different wallet. These are two sets that don't match up very well, right? Like to have a successful ransomware scam, you need the intersection of these two sets, like people who can use Bitcoin and people who fall for scams that are easily clockable. And that's not a big overlap. So for this scam to work, meaning it generates income for you to make the risk of legal trouble worth it, you either have to attack 100,000 people and hope that enough fall for it and give you money that it's worth it. And that happened in 2017. You might've heard about, it's like wanna cry, which again is so freaking lame. Why, if you're gonna scam people, at least be chill. Like, I honestly wonder if being lame is part of the scam. They want you to pay the ransom and not call the, the FBI or anything. So they put on Joker makeup and the fedora. You can't face your coworkers and be like, I got scammed by this loser. So you just pay it and hope it goes away. Don't do that though. Don't pay, don't pay ransomware because it's not embarrassing. Like if you're having a bad day, you can get scammed and that sucks. And I'm sorry that happened to you, but tell everyone you know so nobody else falls for the scam. But I think those giant attacks, they're also, it puts more incentive on the FBI to like find out who did it, if that happens, right? So I think instead, that's why you hear so many of these ransomware attacks happening to companies. Because at a company, like a big telescope, an organization like Alma, you have a thousand people working on site. Maybe one of them falls into this category that doesn't know how to use computers very well, Jerry. And, and the benefit of that is that at this same organization, you also have a whole bunch of people who understand computers very well and are really upset at Jerry and can buy the Bitcoin, right? So that's, I think that's why you hear them attacking like schools, and gas pipelines and observatories and giant book companies with genius hacker mit they've successfully found their niche like a group of people they can scam right these big corporations have some people who aren't that technically savvy but they also have these big it departments that can buy bitcoins okay now it makes sense right so they attack chapters and they attack alma and there they go except no one's gonna pay a ransom because then you're just gonna be in the news for being an idiot who pays a ransom and you're just gonna get hacked again. How does this scam work? You can't specifically target organizations who can buy Bitcoins because those people can also just like back up their data, reorganize their website and prevent future scams and ask Jerry not to check his email. That's it. That's, that's, that's what happens. John Oliver in his video painted this terrifying picture of a future where every computer is hacked and they're hacking your Bluetooth heating setup through the app and turning your heat up. So you have to pay these huge power bills unless you pay the ransom. They're attacking your butt plugs and you can't turn it off no matter how hard you try. And you have to go to the emergency room and say my Bluetooth activated butt plug has been hacked. I'm running this channel on data and science and stuff and this is the second time butt plugs have come up. But here's the thing. If you have your, your heating, like you can remotely change the temperature in your house with an app and someone hacks it and they keep turning the temperature up. Like they 
Again, data is not real. They haven't stolen anything. You can disconnect your heater from the internet. You don't actually need to remotely connect to your heater. I just don't see it as that big of an issue. If this video right now makes the hackers, the hackers, mad at me because I called them lame and they successfully hacked me because I mean, look at me, of course they could. I would just get a new laptop. Like I have my data backed up. I don't, I don't know what genius hacker MIT. I'm not saying no one's been hurt by this scam. They successfully shut down Alma for 48 days. And like those observations that they were going to take will never be done. And, and that sucks for the people who wanted to analyze that data. They've hacked schools, and so all the grade books for the students have been lost. All the online assignments have been lost, and the teachers who are already overworked are being forced to scramble and come up with like paper things they could do, even though everyone's demanding they all have technology class stuff now, and they have to go back to the paper that they haven't done in 10 years, and like it's annoying, and it's stressful for the students who are now accustomed to seeing every single grade posted immediately. And it gets worse than that. Ransomware hackers have hacked hospitals, shut down their computer systems, and as a result, like people's treatments have to be delayed, surgeries have to be delayed, people could die. Like. I'm not saying no one's been hurt by this, but the hospitals don't pay the ransoms. So like, what's the point? Like, do you think you're actually the Joker just like hacking a hospital and being like, ha ha ha, that kid's not gonna get chemo on time. What's the point of that? What's the point? Don Oliver's video came out in 2021, which was the peak of ransomware attacks. And they have been decreasing since mid 2022. So like the number of ransomware attacks is going down for two reasons. The first is that the scam doesn't make sense because no one's paying the ransoms, but also a lot of them were hosted in Russia and it's like something happening in Russia right now. Genius. Hacker. MIT. I think we really got to stop calling this hacking because hacking makes it sound cool. It makes it sound like these people are super smart and they have such a elite knowledge of computer systems and software and hardware. They can hack into the mainframe with their terminals, with the bright green text on the black background. And it's just, it's not, they're just sending a file and they're like, open please. Genius, hacker, MIT. You're just a loser who scams meme off for a living.